Hey everyone, it's Dr. Z. So I don't know if you guys have heard about this coronavirus thing. Apparently it's in the news and there's a lot of um, sort of panic, uh, misapprehension, misunderstanding, miseducation, and then there's a lot of good information. Uh, there's questions like, is the CDC adequately responding? Did the Chinese government try to cover it up? Was the overall response slow? Is this something that's been bioengineered? When is a vaccine coming? What's going on with healthcare workers? And how safe are they going to be, given what we saw in Wuhan, where so many got ill and uh, you know, at least eight have died? What's going to happen to prepare here in the United States so that we can be prepared, but not just scared, which seems to be the common thing where people are hoarding masks and doing things that are actually counterproductive. But my guest today, he's a world expert in this stuff. He is part of a working group working on a coronavirus vaccine. He's the dean of the School of Tropical Medicine at Baylor. Welcome back to the show. You should see our previous interview. He, this guy is awesome. He's a personal hero of mine, Dr. Peter Hotez. He is going to talk about how we can better prepare for what's happening, especially from the standpoint of healthcare workers who, if they get sick, if there's problems there, that's the weak link that could cause everything to be much more difficult. Peter Hotez, welcome back to the show. It's so good to see you, brother. Oh, uh, it's so good to be back on, uh, and you're one of my heroes. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, your five bucks is in the mail, brother. That's awesome. So, hey, you've been all over the news talking about this stuff. So, what I want to do is take your expertise and bring it to a healthcare professional audience that is hearing a lot of hysteria in the news, is trying to deal with panicked patients, and is worried themselves about getting ill because in Wuhan, as we saw, so many healthcare workers actually came down with this, and the hospitals were amplifying sources of infection. I mean, what are your thoughts on this in terms of uh, what's going Going on right now in the current scene of getting prepared in the U.S. Well, you know, one of the lessons learned from all three big corona, coronavirus epidemics, whether it was SARS in 2003 or, or MERS in 2012, and and now this one, is the a lot of the battle was played out in hospitals. There was massive amounts of nosocomial transmission. Lots of frontline healthcare workers uh, affected. You talked about uh, what's going on in Wuhan. Uh, a new paper just came out. Uh, in JAMA, the Journal of American Mer Medical Association, last week, and it found that more than a thousand healthcare frontline healthcare workers in Wuhan were infected, and there were six deaths, and that's pretty important. But beyond the deaths, 15%—I think it was 14.8%—of hospital workers, healthcare workers who were affected, wound up with serious pulmonary disease or were in the ICU. And that's the piece that not a lot of people are talking about. You know, we, we keep on hearing, you know, either that it's a mild disease or only if you're older and have underlying diabetes or heart disease that you have to worry about. It's, it's not the case. We have a serious threat to our healthcare workforce. And for me, that's the weak link in the whole system right now, because what I think, you know, now that we're starting to see the beginnings of community transmission in the U.S., we've had four cases, two in California, one in Washington State, one in Oregon, where people have gotten infected who have never traveled or been exposed to anyone who's uh, knowingly has traveled or not exposed to somebody with, with the SARS-2 coronavirus. What that means is um, we're seeing the beginnings of this community level transmission, and we can now expect our healthcare providers to be uh, increasingly exposed to this virus, working in ICUs, working in emergency rooms, working in clinics. And I think that's the weak link right now, because I think if, if they start to go down, the whole system unravels. It will be an extraordinary level of concern and panic. Uh, it will cause healthcare workers to doubt their their feelings of uh, working in a safe place, and things will start to unravel very quickly. So, what I've been trying to explain to our national leaders is that's where we now have to focus absolutely every effort on preserving and protecting our physicians and nurses and things that we've actually talked about in the past in a different in a very different context but this is especially true for this coronavirus yeah and you know this is so important because i imagine as a hospitalist if we lose two hospitalists on my team of 10 we're we're screwed like we can't function we can't take care of our other patients imagine three or four or five of them get sick and why why is it so we really have to plan for this there's a couple things. How do we prevent it from happening? What kind of precautions do you take? But why is it that there's such a high 
burden of uh, severe disease in healthcare workers? Is it an inoculum effect where they're just getting a big hit of this virus when you're intubating or these droplets are going? Maybe help us understand how it's transmitted now to our understanding and what might be going on. So I'm, I've been wondering the same thing. First of all, I don't I don't think we know. Um, and, you know, we're still in the steep learning curve about this virus. There's more we don't know than we do know. We um, almost certainly this virus is transmitted by respiratory droplet contact, meaning you sneeze or you cough and small micro droplets land on your face that you rub into your mucous membranes of your eyes or mouth or they're on or they land on surfaces and people come into contact with them and then rub their uh, rub it in, into their mucous membranes of their mouth and their eyes and nose that's almost certainly a major method of transmission the thing we don't know and that i'm st starting to suspect is important is true airborne transmission meaning uh, on very tiny less than five micron particles in the air that can travel for feet or sometimes meters. It turns out that not many respiratory viruses do that, or not many viruses do that at all. Uh, but when they do, those diseases are highly contagious. So measles virus does this, mm -hmm. chickenpox uh, virus, varicella virus does this. And the fact that we're starting to see uh, uh, so many people infected and the, the Chinese scientists have come up with a pretty high reproductive number for this virus. That means if a single individual gets it, how many other people get it? We're looking at reproductive numbers now coming out of China of three between three or between three and four. That's at least uh, two or three times higher than flu, which has a reproductive number of between one and two, a seasonal flu uh, anyway. So this is a pretty uh, contagious uh, virus, and, and, and we'll see what kind of numbers we come up with in the U.S. So, so to clarify, reproductive numbers for every infected patient, what? So if it's a four, then four people can get infected typically? On, a, on average. So, yeah. the, so the two extremes that I like to talk about is measles is one of the most uh, contagious viruses we know about if a single individual individual gets measles on average 12 to 18 others will get it if they're not vaccinated that's why you see these big epidemics that are so hard to control and you have to trace down contacts and contacts of the contacts and part of that is because it is a true airborne virus uh, the other extreme is ebola you know in, unless you're taking care of a dead or dying ebola patient you're not going to get ebola it has a pretty low reproductive number of between one and two according to some 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 will put it a little higher and it looks like this coronavirus is, is somewhere in between which is pretty contagious more contagious than flu and the fact that it's landing so many healthcare workers in the hospital to me is a, to me is a red flag on the first major thing that can go wrong uh, right now in this epidemic. And, and, and that's real important because even in Ebola, when we had that patient in Dallas, right, that's almost your neck of the woods right there, we had a couple, one or two nurses get, uh, get sick. And if you're talking about a higher reproductive number now and what we've seen in China with so many healthcare workers, including that the whistleblower guy, Dr. Lee, and, and uh, getting sick, how are we going to prepare healthcare workers in the U.S. for what seems now increasingly inevitable that there's going to be a lot of community transmission? What, what, you know, what type of mask should they be using? What are the sort of scenarios? What should we be thinking about for our folks? Yeah, and, and, and this is why, you know, we had some email uh, con uh, exchanges and I said, I think we should do something uh, about this topic because we're not really hearing about it that much on the, you know, I, I'm whenever, anytime I go on Fox News or MSNBC, it's not easy going back and forth between Fox News and MSNBC. <laughs> For it's real. A whole, it's a whole other story. Political backlash but, or whiplash. But, but, you know, trying to get this point across and, and, we're not, you know, the, for instance, today the the White House held a press conference, and this this topic was not raised at all. And yet, I see it as the biggest issue in this early part part of the epidemic. So, the question is, okay, what do we have to do? Um, I think there's a few things that 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 I've been talking about that come to mind. I mean, some are obvious. So, some are less obvious. I think one of the obvious ones, of course, is we have to make sure the that every hospital. Uh, in the country has adequate personal protective equipment, PPE, and, and we're hearing stories that uh, many hospitals don't. I think we're better off now than we are five years ago because after Ebola, I think a lot of hospitals sort of got it and realized that they had to stock up. And so hopefully uh, that's still on their inventory. So I think we're a little better prepared than we were uh, a few years ago. I don't know quite what that means for 
non-hospital-like settings where you're seeing a lot of patients, either outpatient facilities or some of these, uh, uh, you know, 24-hour freestanding emergency rooms, whether they're adequately uh, prepared or not. So that that's uh, a, a top priority. But I have two other ones that are, are a little less obvious that, that, that people aren't talking about. The second one is... Uh, are the clinical guidelines that I'm reading about from CDC for testing uh, and, 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 and our, our algorithms for this. So what we're seeing is there, that we're only recommending testing for three categories of, of patients. One, individuals who have respiratory symptoms and such, you know, fever, cough, shortness of breath, and who came from one of the known infected countries, uh, whether it's China or Iran or, or Korea, uh, that's one. The second one is those same set of symptoms and having known contact with somebody who's already had that diagnosis, those two are, are pretty obvious. And now recently uh, on the recognition that we're starting to see some community level transmission, they're opening up the option of doing diagnostic testing uh, for someone who has just severe respiratory symptoms, uh, hospitalized with pneumonia, maybe in, uh, intubated in an ICU, and you can't figure out what the heck's going on, then you can test those patients too. And I think those guidelines may not reflect a new reality of what's gonna be happening uh, in the US, which are individuals who are not that sick uh, maybe have mild respiratory symptoms, yet are transmitting the coronavirus. We and also individuals in, uh, who uh, are presenting even with uh, surgical symptoms, abdominal symptoms. So one of the things that was reported in JAMA, uh, the Journal of Medi American Medical Association, about a month ago, uh, was the fact that they have a number of patients on surgical wards in the hospitals in Wuhan who. Uh, uh, were thought to have, whether it was a rule out appendectomy or, or, or something along those lines, turned out that they had the virus and they wound up infecting 10 healthcare workers. Yeah. So this is going to get very murky very quickly. Uh, and I think, so the second piece to this beyond, beyond the PPE is uh, we're, I think CDC is going to have to double down and really think harder about these clinical guidelines. That That's going to be an important one. And then the last one, and then we can have a conversation, is our diagnostic testing, which is, uh, first, it's it, we're, we're about two degrees of separation from where we need to be. Uh, one, uh, right now we don't have enough diagnostic testing kits. Uh, finally, the CDC just kind of released it a, a lift on it saying that other hospitals can develop and validate their own test kit uh, provided uh, that they submit uh, an emergency uh, authorization to the FDA. So that's better th than it was because otherwise we had to wait days sending things to reference labs or the kits weren't available. But the thing I'm worried about there again is, you know, are we going to what we really need is more of a rapid test, like a rapid flu test, where uh, people in emergency rooms uh, in ICUs can rapidly triage patients to isolation facilities uh, if somebody uh, becomes inf if if they know somebody's infected, and it's still still too cumbersome. So we, we've we've got a lot of work cut out for us in order to get up to speed uh, where we can, uh, one, help to control this uh, epidemic, and also second, really protect our, our healthcare providers. And, and that's where I see our big vulnerability currently. Yeah, I'm absolutely with you because, again, as it is, we're going to see surges in capacity requirements in hospitals like we did even during H1N1 swine flu. We're also going to see interesting logistic uh, dilemmas. By the way, speaking of rapid testing, so uh, we work with a, a company on the show once called uh, Cepheid that does rapid uh, molecular PCR for flu. Uh, and they're, I think, in the current currently in the process of working on a rapid test. So I'm sure there's companies working on this, which is good. The the 
interesting logistical issues apart from finding coverage, making sure people stay home when they're having symptoms, wearing masks when you're having symptoms, what type of PPE you need to wear and all those protocols. As it is, my hospital in Las Vegas uh, just sent out a memo saying these are the indications for N95, these are the indications for standard procedural masks, don't hoard them, reuse them, you know, sort of trying to control resources are things like CT scans. So when SARS happened, you know, Stanford had to kind of start to reduce the number of CT scans they did on patients that they were concerned about because the turnaround time to disinfect a CT scanner is roughly 45 minutes. So it gums up the entire workflow for radiology. So there's lots of downstream issues. And then of course the supply chain stuff with getting the PPE and all of that. Have, have you run into any of that too in your work with the public health authorities? Yeah, all of this is uh, now being discussed, and uh, and and it's going to dominate, have to dominate the conversation. Uh, you know, right now we don't know how extensive this epidemic is going to be in the U- United States. We're starting to see the beginnings of community level transmission. We've already got you know a handful of sporadic cases. As time goes on, we'll have to see where this goes. I mean, there's two possible directions that I could envision. One is we'll continue to see small outbreaks, of small levels of community transmission here and there scattered across the country. That would be sort of a best case scenario. Or things will become more confluent and we'll start seeing a pretty significant level of serious illness. And that's the one that I'm particularly worried about where we'll start uh, knocking out healthcare workers because the the study out of JAMA last week showed that 14.8% uh, of healthcare workers landed in uh, either in the ICU or were seriously ill with pneumonia. And you can imagine the uh, emotional and physical impact of that, if, if, if this occurs on a pretty big scale, you may, who, know, who, knows where that will ha- who knows where that will go, but almost certainly it'll become highly destabilizing. I mean, look what happened in Hong Kong, the physicians and actually went on strike uh, because of their concern about this issue. And uh, I would hate to see anything even close to that happening in this country. You know, and uh, already the <clears throat> National Nurses uh, United and, and others have talked about what happened at UC Davis, where I think the patient was there and they felt there wasn't um, p- potentially enough uh, protection for staff. And, and as it is, they're the victims of violence and other things, uh, uh, especially frontline nurses. So this is a this is a big issue. And I think no one's talking about it really because it's not a the public doesn't see that as the central issue. But the truth is, without our caregivers, we don't have a response. Right. And also remember, I mean, this builds on all the great stuff that you've been talking about. I mean, not great in a good way, but great in a terrible way, which is, you know, don't call it burnout. Uh, call it moral injury between electronic health records and how we treat our health care providers and their debt and their and how demoralized they are to begin with. If you now throw this on top of it, uh, you know, it, it could, you know, cause irreparable damage to, to our profession. Well, you know, Peter, so I'm glad you brought that up before we get into things like vaccine and the response and the CDC and all that, because I think people want to know about that. But I want to dwell on this for a second. One of the, I think, imperatives of managing large numbers of patients is to, at during a crisis like this, say, you know what, I am not clicking boxes in Epic or Cerner or <laughs> Meditech. I'm going to take care of the patient and scribble some notes about this, and we'll worry about the documentation second. Because, you know, you even worry about you know these these keyboards and other things like that uh, if we don't have proper. Um, uh, sterilization of that stuff being another problem, but it's really the time and the documentation. In times like this, this is when people step up and actually perform at their best, even under great danger. You can imagine medical students who are doing their first rotation, going into the room with someone with a, a you know a, a ICU level infection of COVID-19, uh, getting intubated and and feeling that that sense of oh my gosh, you know that this this is a this is a real potentially dangerous situation, but that's why I went into this. You don't want to distract people with, oh, but you also haven't, you know, clicked the box that said I washed my hands. You know, so this idea of actually this is this is not to be time the time to be sitting behind a large keyboard that you bring down and start looking at the patient and clicking on a computer, right? And doing Bingo. data entry. So Bingo. who knows? Maybe there'll be a silver lining to this. It may, it may be a wake-up call for that we don't we, we could start 
practicing medicine the way we should be practicing medicine again. Heaven forbid. So um, back to this thing. So what would you, so if you're going to give advice, say, before we go move on to vaccines and things like that, if you were going to give advice to, say, nurses, medical students, others who are taking care of patients and we're starting to see an influx, let's say, what would you say? Just listen to the protocols of your hospital. Is there any other sort of common sense things that they can do to keep safe themselves so they can continue to care for patients? Well, I think, one, we're going to have to see this uh, sea change coming out of the federal government and CDC on the guidelines uh, for clinical testing because it, it it's not it, – it, it's – it's clear that it's not really reflecting the realities of, of what doctors and nurses are gonna be seeing in the hospital. So that's number one. Number two, I think with the chief medical officer of the hospital, it's gonna be very important to sit down with that individual, have a frank discussion and do some reality testing of what's gonna be the most practical solution from this. And it, and it can't be, top down. There's got to be some consensus building. There's got to be, uh, I think, the, the frontline staff, the nurses, the techs, the docs have to be part of the uh, part of the discussion with the chief medical officer and the hospital leadership on, on what makes sense. Because if they feel that unrealistic things are being uh, put down their throat, it's it's that's going to go very badly as well. Yeah, I agree. I agree. So let's uh, let's move on to vaccine because I think people are really interested in hearing from you, the expert on this, who's working on this. What are the prospects for a vaccine? What's the process? What's the time frame? And how effective will it be? And was SARS a good uh, primer for this, given the the work done on a SARS vaccine that never ultimately was fully implemented because SARS mostly was controlled? Well, we learned a lot about. Um, when after SARS in 2003 and then MERS in 2012, we learned a lot about uh, what we need to do to make an effective and safe uh, coronavirus vaccines. And our effort to make a vaccine is building on that, on that effort. In fact, we actually developed uh, as a consortium with, uh, when I say we, Baylor College of Medicine, Texas Children's Hospital, the Galveston National Laboratory, and New York Blood Center, we developed a prototype vaccine based on SARS that was both uh, uh, highly effective in laboratory animals at preventing challenge infections and was also very safe. And, and I'll come back to that safety issue in a minute because it's a huge one. And what we found was it was a great vaccine, but that at the time we could never get anybody interested in uh, supporting us to move it into clinical trials because nobody cared about SARS app. Uh, anymore. Wow. So that was very frustrating. Here we had this vaccine. It was actually manufactured under good manufacturing practices with Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. We were ready to go. We, you know, that's what we do. We are my my day job is a is a vaccine scientist developing vaccines for neglected and emerging infections. The ones the big pharma companies are not interested in because there's no. Uh, big financial uh, profit or any financial profit to be made, and coronavirus vaccines are, are 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 included among that. So we made this vaccine, and then nobody cared about it. But fortunately, my science partner of 20 years, uh, who co-directs the vaccine center with me, Mary Elena Batazzi, had the wisdom to keep it on stability protocol, so we know it's still good uh, even after uh, a number of years. So it's ready to go now, and so we're trying to move it into uh, clinical trials. So we have our vaccine that'll go into clinical trials. There's some other platform technologies around RNA and DNA vaccines and uh, other other interesting technologies. So we'll have about half a dozen vaccines that can move into clinical testing. That's the good news. The difficult news is this, uh, despite, what, despite what the anti-vaccine lobby likes to claim that vaccines are not adequately tested for safety, quite the opposite is true. Among pharmaceuticals, vaccines are the single most heavily tested pharmaceuticals we have for safety. And um, and that and it's hard to compress those timelines uh, to go through phase one, two, and three clinical trials. So we're probably looking at at least a year uh, before we're going to have both a safe and effective vaccine ready to distribute to population. So I doubt very much we're going to have a vaccine uh, in time for this epidemic, despite what you're hearing from all the hype from the biotechs, you know, we're pushing their technology and they're sending out this, these ridiculous press releases saying we're going to have a coronavirus <laughs> vaccine in a period of weeks. 
you know, that it's, it's only a half truth. They'll have a coronavirus ready for clinical testing like ours, uh, perhaps in a few weeks, but it's, it's going to have to go through that long, arduous process. The other piece to this is there's a particular problem with coronavirus and respiratory virus vaccines in general. You know, each, each, a vaccine for each disease has its own unique difficulties. In the case of respiratory viruses, what happens is in the 60s, uh, there was a group at the NIH and, and Children's National Medical Center that developed a, uh, a formal and inactivated RSV vaccine, respiratory syncytial virus vaccine. And that vaccine actually wound up making kids worse. And there, I think there were even two deaths in those clinical trials wow. from the vaccinated group. And it turns out that certain respiratory virus vaccines can trigger through mechanisms that, mechanisms that we don't entirely understand, something called immune enhancement, where you get eosinophils uh, filtering into the lung and it actually will make things worse. And what we found and was that when we started, when, when scientists started making the first generation coronavirus vaccines after SARS using killed vaccines or even the whole spike protein from the virus, it actually made things worse, just like, almost like what we saw with RSV. So he said, holy crap, you know, this is gonna be a big issue now for coronavirus vaccines. And our collaborators, our colleagues at the New York Blood Center had found that if they only use the receptor binding domain of the virus, it actually uh, seemed to prevent the immune enhancement. So that's the reason we chose that and why we're excited about this vaccine. But the relevance here is the regulators, the FDA, the scientists at the FDA are going to want to be very careful and very cautious how they proceed with clinical trials. Because what happens when you do a phase one trial or a phase two trial in healthy volunteers in an area where you have sustained community transmission? Will some of those vac vaccinated individuals, will they uh, uh, d develop immune enhancement? Uh, and so that's going to be looked at very closely, and it's really going to slow slow things down for vaccine development. So unfortunately, I think that's a long way to say we're not going to have a vaccine in time for this epidemic. See, that's really important. And one thing I wanted to ask you about that was when you say immune enhancement, does that mean you get that phenomenon after vaccination without infection or when you get no, infected? No, no. What happens infection? is you get vaccinated. And, and then you're exposed to the virus, right. you know, being in the community. And those, and in the case of RSV, the, that first generation RSV vaccine, that's what happens. The kids did actually worse uh, than the non-vaccinated kids. So they had to go back to the drawing board and actually killed uh, uh, vaccine development for RSV for a generation. Now the Gates Foundation and others are trying to support new generation RSV vaccines with the idea that as you do your clinical development, you work hard to avoid uh, it, it uh, avoid it and, and, and make certain you design your vaccine to, to minimize that. Yeah, and we have not seen that with influenza vaccination though. No, no, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be a problem with uh, influenza vaccines. Yeah. Uh, or at least uh, uh, the ones we use for seasonal flu, but it is has been a problem with RSV and, and in laboratory animals, it's been a problem for coronavirus vaccines. Yeah, it makes sense. So, so what do we do? So I think, you know, I think uh, antiviral drug development for people who are seriously ill, I think that's proceeding pretty quickly. You know, and if you look at the tiers of difficulty for getting something licensed, vaccines are always the highest bar, that takes the longest, then comes small molecule drugs, antiviral drugs in this case, or and then diagnostics are sort of somewhat lower hanging fruit. So hopefully we'll get some new diagnostics in there very quickly, followed by small molecule drugs. And then uh, if, if we can work out uh, the business model and other things, ha have a vaccine maybe a year from now or so. One of the other problems we're seeing with coronavirus vaccines is nobody's rushing in in terms of the big pharmaceutical companies. They don't see this as a money-making proposition. So what you're seeing is either uh, academic-based research groups like ours, which is called a product development partnership, but it's a nonprofit developing vaccines, or some of the biotechs, small and mid-sized biotechs. And a lot of the biotechs are pushing it because not necessarily that they see money to made in coronavirus vaccines, but it's a way to accelerate their platform technologies 
So if we can move this along, then later on they could say, well, we already have precedent from the FDA that licensed this vaccine. Now we can apply it to the others. Yeah, makes makes sense. And one thing that you've recommended that I agree with is the one thing we don't want to do is deal with three epidemics at once. So we have coronavirus. OK, we're doing what we can. But influenza and measles, these things are seasonal as well. And they may overlap the seasonality, which we should talk about with coronavirus as well, if there is seasonality with coronavirus. So definitely make sure you get your flu shot and make sure you are and your family and your children are vaccinated against measles because as it is capacity will be strained correct yeah i mean if um remember if we start seeing an uptick now in uh, in this sars 2 coronavirus we have other things going on and one of them is it's a bad flu season this year we've had at least 16,000 deaths, most among unvaccinated individuals, including about 100 unvaccinated kids. So flu is still raging right now. And so this is a bad flu season and it'll probably go until late, late in the spring, maybe until May. Yeah. So that's going on. We also have this problem that measles came back last year and it might come back again this year. And if it does, historically measles peaks late winter, early spring. So that's what we're also looking out for. And measles, as you know, is, is really occupies the, the full time of any uh, healthcare department. So, you know, if we have to start battling measles and flu at the same time as this coronavirus, it, it it's undoable. It's it that 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 will be a no win proposition. Well, so. Peter, I think what we should do is we should have coronavirus parties, COVID-19 parties, where we all fly to Wuhan, go hang out in a meat market or in a healthcare facility and get exposed naturally. Because, Peter, first of all, A, you're a vaccine shill. B, um, this is all natural immunity. So why would I inject myself with toxins? Should we go ahead and send anti-vaxxers to China to test this theory? Oh, well, we're already seeing... um and uh, now I'm already seeing on Twitter, I'm being accused of secretly engineering and, and creating this coronavirus so I could <laughs> sell more of my vaccine. That's that's a great one. I, I, I think the best one, though, was um, it turned out that it was me and Bill Gates making making coronavirus, uh, oh making this uh, coronavirus. And I think I replied, yeah, we uh, except you got the place wrong. We actually did it in a secret lab in Area 51. And See, they don't understand. It's area, it's always Area 51. So, you know, they'd be singing songs like, you know, Bill and Peter sitting in a tree. K-I-L-L-I-N-G. I mean, these people are in are really something, man. Yeah, and 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 remember, what's the biggest city near Area 51? That's Las Vegas, right, buddy? I'm just You're saying. Welcome. I'm just saying. You're welcome. <laughs> we keeps it real in my hood. Uh, I'm back in the yay. Oh, speaking of which, so I am in. I'm in the epicenter of some community, potential community transmission here. And it's interesting to see people walking around with masks and stuff. Is that a, a dumb, as dumb a thing to do as, uh, as I might suspect it might be? Out in the community. Well, you know, Mary, you know, first of all, it has to be the right kind of mask. The typical surgical masks don't do very much to prevent uh, infection. What it will do is if you're sick, it may prevent the droplets from spreading to other people, and, yep. and that's fine. But if you're wearing a mask because you think it's going to uh, protect you against coronavirus, that's just a, just a false sense of security. Right, because uh, you, have your, you have your ocular mucous membranes too, right? If someone's coughing out there, can't the dro respiratory droplets uh, end up in your eyes and your nose, I mean, are around the mask? Yeah, that's, you know, you could walk around wearing PPE too. I mean, I guess <laughs> you could do that. I mean, look, right now... You know, and it and it's very hard. You know, one of the hardest things to do in public health communication in the middle of a of a serious epidemic like this one is to somehow provide reassurance without overly simplifying it, without just saying, "Oh, yeah, it's just a cold," right? Because it's it's not. Right. It's got a pretty high case fatality rate, and that two percent number seems to be turning out to be the case. At first, people were saying, "Well, no, that doesn't really account for a big denominator." of people with low-grade symptoms. But now the World Health Organization has come out and said, nope, that 2% number is looking like it might be real, and which is significant, right? That's, that's 10, 20 times higher than seasonal flu in terms of right. mor mortality rates. And we already heard about the high uh, case rate of serious illness or, or critical illness among healthcare professionals. And it's pretty highly transmissible as well with that reproductive number of between three or four. So if you... Add all those things together, this is going to be a pretty serious epidemic. Do, 
But on the other hand, we don't right now have a level of serious uh, of high levels of transmission going on in the U.S. We have four cases. So it's something that we're just going to have to be mindful of to, to watch over time. I mean, you know, if we replay this uh, two weeks from now, the world may look very different and, 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 and what we're saying may, may seem out of touch. Uh, yeah. But we'll have to see how, the, how this proceeds. You know, it's a brand new virus agent. We don't know what's going to happen. You know, there are some who are saying, well, uh, coronavirus are coronaviruses, some of them are seasonal, they peak in the winter. And that's true. Some of them do, uh, particularly in the northern hemisphere. But again, this is a brand new virus agent, we have no way to know. And, and that doesn't, we've never gone through a whole year of this new SARS-2 coronavirus that started at the end of last year. Yeah. And we don't know what happens in the tropics, like flu is all year round in the tropics or in the southern hemisphere, where it's inverted and it peaks in, in July and August. So rely, you know, and we don't really understand the basis of seasonality either. So there's, it's very hard to predict where this thing is going to head and how destabilizing it's going to be in terms of uh, stock market and, and whether it will trigger something like a recession or whether it'll even affect the outcome of the election. Uh, lots, lots we don't know. And one of the reasons that one of the things that I'm very interested in is looking at that whole geopolitical space for serious infectious diseases. So I've just finished uh, writing a new book that we haven't come up with the title yet. I'm working with Johns Hopkins University Press to find a good title, but it's got the very unwieldy working title of Vaccines in an Age of War, Political Collapse, Climate Change, and Anti-Science. <laughs> it's you, like the Four it, Horsemen it, of the Apocalypse get, Plus yeah, You get the idea that there's yeah. all of these new social and physical determinants that we never had to really think about before and now having big effects on the rise of disease. Well, so, and it's interesting, so I wanna bring that back to the communication of this because there is so much uncertainty. Uh, the CDC has been criticized. The Chinese government has been criticized. There have been all kinds of conspiracy theories as you've seen online. Um, how do you parse this, this criticism of uh, CDC and the, and the overall response to this given that the first cases were discovered in December potentially? Well, you know, I, I also try to emphasize a lot what, what's gone right uh, in terms of our response. Look, I mean, this virus, we didn't know it existed until the end of last year, end of in December. And that's only a few weeks ago. And within a very short period of time, the, the Chinese, all that investment in science in China really paid off. And via SARS, the, you mean? Within a short time, they actually isolated the virus. We knew what it was. We had the full genetic code of the virus. We knew what receptor in the lungs this virus was binding to. I mean, just incredible amounts of information in a short period of time. And the Chinese, you know, all the accusations about them not being transparent on the scientist side, they were putting all this stuff up on BioArchive, which is a preprint server uh, that anybody can download and ac access and downloads. So, so, and that made it possible for us to say, hey, we might have a good vaccine here. So, so that's gone really well. So, so let, me, let me put a point on that because when I did my first video on coronavirus, I said exactly that. I actually said, you know, the Chinese government did something quite remarkable here, which is this real early and aggressive intervention. It's, it's almost like uh, uh, you have a very difficult situation and they actually did a decent job. And, uh, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, you're underplaying this. You don't understand. It's all a conspiracy and this has been totally covered up and so on and so forth. But honestly, seeing what's gone right now, you've dealt with epidemics over 20 years. You know, is this is this vastly different than other things you've seen? Well, certainly the level of flow of information in the science, you, you can't compare this to any others. I was, I was impressed with SARS in 2003. However, a period of a year, we had the virus in the sequence and we learned about its mode of transmission. This is compressed a week. So this is really impressive. Yeah. Um, you know, there, ha you know, nothing has gone perfectly. Uh, you know, this epidemics with new pathogens set up government leaders to look bad because there's always gonna be missteps and everybody knows what the missteps are. And you know, what what I notice is when I'm going on cable news networks, there's there's the, the journalists often wanna do a lot of gotcha stuff with whoever's making decisions. And they're sometimes frustrated with me because I, I temper that to say, look, I saw this with anthrax in 2001, I saw it with H1N1 in 2009, I saw it with Ebola 2014, and then Zika, 
this is what happens. There's always stumbles. There are always missteps early on in the course. And, and, and I make that statement that, again, that uh, new epidemics with new pathogens set you up to make you look bad. And, and that's what's happening here. You know, there's a lot of accusations. Some of it deserved, but a lot of it not, not, not justified. I think everybody at CDC and Health and Human Services is working overtime trying to fi- figure this thing out, working with the state and local uh, health departments. I actually think the team that's been put in place uh, in terms of the people there are looking pretty good and, at, at CDC and Health and Human Services. I think the other thing that people forget is they somehow think that the CDC is going to fight this thing, and that, that's not the way it works. The CDC gets called in in an advisory capacity, it falls to the local and state health departments along with hospital personnel to, that are going to lead the defense against this coronavirus vaccine. And, and that's another vulnerability. Some of our some of our uh, county and local health departments are outstanding, like what we have here in Houston and Harris County. It's one of some of the best health, de- health department staffs in the world. New York City is great. San Francisco, I'm sure, is great. But some of the smaller rural counties are, just don't have adequate capacity. They're being chronically underfunded. They don't have the staff or the training. And that's where we, that's a vulnerability as well, other than the hospital staff is trying to shore up our, our, our depleted health system, particularly with the, some of the smaller uh, local health departments. And hopefully that tranche of funding from Congress and who knows what the number is going to be, whether it's 2.5 billion or 8 billion. Uh, hopefully a good chunk of that will filter down to the local health departments. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And actually, again, to emphasize that all healthcare is local and public health is no exception. There's a big local component. So like you said, so they're jackhammering my street outside. So it's probably a good sign to uh, we've covered quite a bit of ground. <laughs> to, Absolutely. Yeah, to try to um, start to wrap up here. So I have a, a, a sort of related but unrelated question. Have you seen my coronavirus music video yet? I have not, but uh, I've been a, I've been traveling, but I, I promise to look at it. All right, I'm going to send it to you and force you to uh, undergo. It's like uh, Clockwork Orange is just eyes held open, forced to watch this terrible music video that has some education in it. Well, what you could do is either end this with that video or begin it or have it as sort of the background. I, I don't want to taint the conversation with uh, with too much rock and roll, Peter, because uh, it's, it's you know rock and roll's got to stand on its own. But listen, so I <laughs> I want to thank you for first of all all the work you've done over the years for working on this vaccine, for being a source of reason and knowledge uh, for the press. You know, you're bouncing between MSNBC and Fox and you're actually <laughs> having to deal with the political uh, ramifications, the whiplash from that and doing the science that you're doing. So I wanna thank you on behalf of the ZPAC for also taking into account the healthcare professionals that are at risk with this and how they can stay safe. So thank you so much for that, Peter. Thanks so much. And again, thanks for all your great work and advocacy. It's uh, what you're doing is so important. Oh, thank you. I, I, that coming from you, that means a lot. Guys, I got to say, ZPAC, if you can do me a favor and share this video so that we can get actual knowledge out there. Can you guys hear the jackhammering? That's, that's, that's the CDC black helicopters that are coming with the boots. Right, Peter? That's the thing, right? Well, the, well, the irony is now there's a leaf blower in front of my house. So, um, <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> I'm trying to read the letters on it. Uh, <laughs> oh, man. After my coronavirus video, I think I might be persona non grata with the Chinese government because I made a few jokes about them redacting my cough. But that's uh, neither here nor there. So, uh, Peter, thanks again. And uh, uh, we're really excited for any updates you have. Please come back on the show to keep us posted as this thing evolves. And everybody out there, please stay safe and uh, prepared. All right, guys, we out.